Christ. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I shall feast at the table spread for me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. All the days, all the days of my life. All right, turn over one page to hymn number 231. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Think about the day that the Lord saved you. Hymn number 231. <clears throat> Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave your worry. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary, burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, the Savior can see every heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. All right, you may be seated, and we'll turn to hymn number 171. O worship the King, <coughs> all glorious above. Hymn number 171. O worship the King, all glorious above. And gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, Pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. O oh, tell of His might and sing of His grace, Whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, his chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. 
Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. And then our last hymn, hymn 179, or 169, <coughs> excuse me. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hymn number 169. <coughs> Man of sorrow, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruin sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was He. Full atonement can it be. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die, it is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes our glorious King, all his ransomed home to bring. Then anew this song will sing. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Amen. Good singing this morning. Yeah, that's not very professional, is it? I bet the Pope doesn't have one of those baby burp rags there. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, you just continue to keep folks in prayer as, as uh, they're serving the Lord and all that's going on right now. Uh, with everybody, um, pray for Brother Nate and the house to sell and <clears throat> everything going on with that. And uh, that we'll pray that. Look at that, Brother Paul. That thing's splitting on me. Do I need to glue that? Gail? Is it Gail Ripplinger? Look, Gail. Now we're live. Gail, what's going on with this? Just kidding. See, that's what happens. <laughs> you don't have to. I'm just giving you a hard time. You can gorilla glue it, brother. <laughs> anyway, well, listen, we'll have lunch here right after this message, and, and then... Uh, We'll come back and, and this afternoon have another message here. I want to bring you uh, a, kind of a second part to that first one that I did, uh, but really explaining you doctrinally how Rome and Islam have a lot of uh, similarities. A lot of similarities. Too similar. All right? But um, And then it'll give you an understanding of 
where that mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, where that all comes from, how that all kind of pushes out and uh, into different areas. And because sometimes we think too institutionalized, well, the devil's kingdom is not that organized like that. He's got a lot of different facets of things that he does and uh, that his kingdom does. So uh, we need to understand that. A lot of different generals and and everything like that. So anyway, so we'll, we'll cover that here. And then the guys went out and preached here yesterday. You all went to Northfield, right? Brother Paul tr stayed out of trouble. He was... Not really. I, not really. I, just, I don't think so. I don't think that's the way it worked. But um, I tried to get in trouble too. He tried a couple times to get in trouble. He said, but uh, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> Let me tell you what he's saying. Why he's saying that? Because the the chief of police had told him that. You know, you, you can't be used. There's some things that you can't say. And you can say anything that's in this book, okay? There's nothing in this book that you can't say, all right? Um, and the day somebody tries to tell you that is the day that we obey God rather than man and we say what's in the book. And that's what he's talking about, so. Yeah, they're not worried about what they're... It's, it's, the, it's the, the, the men and women that don't want to hear it because they don't want to be convicted. You know, they don't want to be convicted by sin. That's the that's the real problem. When you preach this book and preach against sin and fornication, adultery, and all those things, when you preach against those things, it's convicting. It brings conviction, and we don't want to hear that because we want to live in our flesh. And uh, anyway, so praise the Lord. They went out yesterday. I was doing a lot of studying, and, and I knew I wasn't going to have time to put everything together like I was doing, so uh, the Lord led me to do that. But that's why Brother Paul is in charge of that ministry. Amen? He leads that ministry, and I appreciate that. And uh, you know, he uh, he's doing a good job with that. I appreciate his Amen. his work in that, and all the guys that went out. Amen. Praise the Lord that they all got to go out and and preach yesterday. Uh, turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter two, please. Colossians chapter two. We're going to talk about Rome and the Immaculate Conception Deception. So why is this important to talk about? Well, because it's a perverted Bible. It's a perverted doctrine, uh, and it's found in other religions as well. It's found in others besides mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, it's Rome, where that spirit of the mystery has rested, uh, that, that spirit, that Babylonian spirit has rested in, in, um, in Rome. Uh, now, Colossians chapter 2, verse number 8, the Bible says this, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. It's a warning. Then he says here in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse number 18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as is silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by traditions from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It's not after traditions of men. Not after traditions of men that we follow. We follow the words of God. We do not follow traditions of men will get you into a lot of trouble. Traditions of men will get you to you'll transgress the words of God by following the traditions of men. You will disobey the words of God if you follow the traditions of men. The Immaculate Conception is a man-made doctrine. Well, it's a devil-made doctrine, but it comes from the devil. It comes from man. It does not come from God. It is not a doctrine from the words of God. You say, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to explain to you what that means uh, by, by Rome's own words. And you're going to see this in the next hour. You're going to see how Islam believes the same thing that Rome does. Well, how did that happen? How did some guy running around named Mohammed with a sword in his hand on a horse in the desert, roaming around, how in the world, in Mecca, how in the world could he come up with that Mary was immaculately conceived? Where would he get such a thing from? Got it from his mama. That's where he got it from. That's where he got it from. And uh, like I'll illustrate the next next hour, Rome is the mom of Islam. You like that, Ryan? 
I got I got rhyming rhymes today. See that? How about? <laughs> we won't have any of those. <laughs> I got I got the immaculate conception deception and Rome is the mom of Islam. How about that today? These titles are just catchy today. Anyway. All right, well, let's, hear, let's see what Rome says about this. Let's see from their own doctrine. Use their own words. You don't have to make them up. You just use what they say. Doctrine affirming that the Blessed Virgin Mary was preserved in the first instant of her conception by a singular grace and privilege of God, omnipotent and because of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race. See how they pervert this? Free from all stain of original sin. So Mary had no sin, they're saying. As stated by Blessed Pius the Ninth, Blessed Pius. Well, if Blessed Pius says it, then it must be true. Because <laughs> he says it, so it's got to be true. With a guy like with a, with a guy named like Blessed Pius, you can't argue with that guy. Blessed Pius the Ninth in his Declaration of the Dogma, December eighth, eighteen fifty four. Thus, Mary was conceived in the state of perfect justice free from original sin and its consequences, in virtue of the redemption archive achieved excuse me, by Christ on the cross. In this sense, the privilege of the Immaculate Conception was the anticipated fruit of Christ's saving passion, death, and resurrection. It was only fitting that she who was the, to bear the Savior of the world should herself be preserved by him from sin and its consequences and so be the first to benefit from what he would obtain for the whole human race. So, I mean, you see, Mary was the same as Jesus, is what they're saying. See how they make her a co-redeemer of Christ, with Christ? Well, you see, Mary, she was conceived in without sin. Without a sin nature. She had no sin nature. Mary was perfect. We're going to look at what the King James Bible says about that, okay? Because that's going to correct everything. But, but, um, but we'll get to that in a second. What a story, huh? How about that story? What a story. Well, Mary just, you know, she was she was immaculately conceived, and, you know, Mary's mother didn't know what was going on there. The only problem is you can't find that story anywhere in the Bible. Okay? It's another gospel. It's another Christ. See, one thing you have to understand is, by believing the immaculate conception, what you have believed is another Jesus. What Jesus is that that you believed? Well, his name would be Horus. Horus, Isis, and Osiris. That's who you're believing in. Because, you see, you think because the name is the same, they're talking about the same people. Turn to Matthew chapter 24, verse number 23. Why are we so duped into believing because somebody uses the name Jesus that that's the same Jesus you're talking about? Why? Matthew 24, 23, that if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers. Believe it not. I find that interesting, that secret chambers. Isn't that interesting? Hmm? Behold, if he's in a cave somewhere, or in your bowl of spaghetti, or in your apple pie, or in your apple, believe it not. That's what he said. Why? Because he said there's going to be a lot of false signs and wonders that are, that are going to come up. I mean, these people that say they all over the Pope have said, oh, all these, uh, they have these visions of the Blessed Mary over here in this cave, and these little children were walking in the woods playing marbles one day, and they found, they, they yeah, I had something like that, or jacks or something, I forgot the story. But anyway, they were playing, and they were, and they, they went into this cave, and there they saw her right there. Oh, I believe they saw something. I believe they saw something. They saw Isis, queen of heaven. That's who they saw. They saw a vision of that devil. And I believe that. See, that yeah, the, there's a female, male, okay, sides to these devils, okay? Um, I don't say they're females. Now, now, listen closely. I didn't say that they were female, and, and I, I said they have a male-female side. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? And they're always pushing that in occultism and everything else. They're always pushing that male-female generative principle, everything. They're always pushing that. I didn't say that they were they were actual females, but they come as that. So understand that. Jesus told us, he warned us that there would arise false Christ. They would preach false Christ. If you pre preach a, a immaculate conception, that is a false Christ. That is not the Christ of the Bible because Mary was never said to be perfect and ne never said that there was an immaculate conception that took place. How about the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that what they say of the immaculate conception of Mary? To become the mother of the Savior, Mary was enriched by God with gifts appropriate to such a role. The angel Gabriel at the moment of the Annunciation salutes her as full of grace. In fact, in order for Mary to be able to give the free assent of her faith to the announcement of her vocation, it was necessary that she, she be wholly born by God's grace. <laughs> Through the centuries, the church has become ever more aware that Mary, full of grace, through God, was redeemed from the moment of her conception. This is what the dogma of the Immaculate Conception confesses, says Pope Pius IX, proclaimed in 1844. The most blessed virgin was, from the first moment of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God, and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. Really? So she didn't need a Savior. She was already predestined. Almost sounds like a, a hyper-Calvinism, doesn't it? That's what it sounds like. The most blessed Virgin Mary is for the moment of her conception, a singular privilege. Okay, uh, next. The splendor of an entirely unique holiness, he says, by which Mary is enriched for the, from the first instant of her conception, comes wholly from Christ. She is redeemed in a more exalted fashion by reason of the merits of her Son. The Father blessed Mary more than any more any other created person in Christ. Every bless every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, and chose her in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before Him in love. But do you do you see how they do that? Do you see how they 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 are they are making the birth because she was the vessel that was used. They make the earthly birth more important than God's work. It's the worship of Isis. It's the worship of, of Astaroth, Queen of Heaven. It's, it's that worship that they're doing. They, all they did, all Roman Catholicism did was take what they had and change the names. That's all Constantine did. That's all he did. He changed the names. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the fathers of the Eastern tradition call the Mother of God the All Holy. Panagia, and celebrate her as free from any stain of sin, as though fashioned by the Holy Spirit and formed as a new creature. By the grace of God, Mary remained free of every personal sin her whole life long. Well, I'm going to prove to you that's a lie. The word immaculate means without stain. They're saying that Mary was conceived without sin, that she lived a perfect sinless life. That's what they're saying. Where do they get that from? From hell. That's where they get it from. But they don't get it from the Bible. They don't get it from the words of God. And it's important because there are billions of Catholics that believe a false gospel. They're dying and going to hell. And you know what? A lot of Baptists can't come along and show them why. Because they say, well, we believe in the Trinity. We believe in Jesus. See, we believe in, we believe in Jesus. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe these things. Ah, but what Jesus do you believe? The Horus, the Horus and Isis, Osiris, or do you believe what the words of God say? The Catechism of the Catholic Church says of the Immaculate Conception of Mary in the New Advent Catholic Encyclopedia, they say this, The term conception does not mean the act of regenerative conception of by her parents. Her body was formed in the womb of the mother, and the father had the usual share in its, in its formation. The question does not concern the immaculateness of the generative activity of her parents. Neither does it concern the passive conception absolutely and simply. 
which according to the order of nature precedes the infusion of the rational soul. The person is truly conceived when the soul is created and infused into the body. Mary was preserved exempt from all stain of original sin at the first moment of her animation. And sanctifying grace was given to her before sin could have taken effect on her soul. <laughs> so much for that whole born a sinner thing. <laughs> she was preserved exempt from all stain of original sin. The, former, the formal active essence of original sin was not removed from her soul. Listen. As it, as it is removed from others by baptism, which is false, it was excluded. It never was in her soul. Simultaneously, with the exclusion of sin, the state of original sanctity, innocence, and justice, as opposed to original sin, was conferred upon her, by which gift every stain and fault, all depraved emotions, passions, and debilities essentially pertaining to original sin were excluded. But she was not made exempt from the temporal penalties of Adam, from sorrow, bodily infirmities, and death. By a singular privilege and grace granted by God in view of the merits of Jesus Christ. But never says that. See, that's another gospel. Mary got saved a different way, right? So Mary got saved a different way. The immunity from original sin was given to Mary by a singular exemption from a universal law through the same merits of Christ, says this new advent, by which other men are cleansed from sin by baptism. Mary needed the redeeming Savior to obtain this exemption and to be delivered from the universal necessity and debt of being subject to original sin. The person of Mary, in consequence of her origin from Adam, should have been subject to sin, but being the new Eve, who was to be the mother of the new Adam, she was, by the eternal counsel of God and by the merits of Christ, withdrawn from the general law of original sin. Hear that, hear that hyper-Calvinism? By the eternal counsel of God. Now I know where Calvin got it. We always knew he got it from Augustine. Anyway. Her redemption was a very masterpiece of Christ's redeeming vision. He is a greater redeemer who pays the debt that it may not be incurred than he who pays after it has fallen on the debtor. See, here's what they say. No direct or categorical stringent proof of the dogma. This is Now, this is an admittance from Roman Catholics, from, from their... Catholic Advent Encyclopedia. No direct or categorical or stringent proof of the dogma can be brought forward from Scripture. Wow, what an admission. <laughs> but the first scriptural passage which contains the promise of the redemption mentioned also the mother of the Redeemer. <laughs> Wait a minute. So what you're telling me is you have no authority for what you're teaching? You're just saying that that's... We have no proof from the Bible that Mary was immaculately conceived. The immaculate conception was true. So you just went ahead and made that up, or what? <laughs> Book of opinions, right? So, um, yeah, we, we kind of didn't have any proof of it, but uh, it sounded like a good thing at the time, so we just decided to go with it. Okay, I'm going to read you something here. In Genesis, in the King James Bible, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's King James. The RSV says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, the Dewey Ramey online Bible. Okay? That's the Catholic one. Ready, Brother Paul? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. Um, yeah, that's a little different. Not even the RSV had the gall to do that, okay? And that's bad enough. But 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 it was bad enough they did that. But they the do what are they saying? Mary is the savior. Mary is exalted. Mary is the savior. Mary is the one, not Jesus. It's not about Christ. It's about Mary. What is that? Nimrod's wife, Isis, Osiris, Nimrod. Remember that Babylon series way back then? I did long time ago. Nimrod's wife. Yes, yeah, Samaramus, that's right. Yep, same thing. That's right. It's all the same. No different. 
it's the same in Freemasonry. But I don't have time to go, go into that right now. The sentence against the first parents were accompanied, this is the Catholic Advent magazine again, the sentence against the first parents were accompanied by the earliest gospel, pro, Proto-Evangelium, which put enmity between the serpent and the woman. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and her seed. She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie and wait for her heel. Okay. The translation, she, of the Vulgate is interpretive. It originated after the 4th century and cannot be defended critically. <laughs> do, you, do, you realize, do you realize that they are admitting? I mean, we don't have any Bible for this. <laughs> it's not really in the Bible or anything. We just thought it sounded cool. <laughs> this is great. Mary was perfect. It just sounded good. So we went with it. God puts enmity between her and Satan in the same manner and measure as there is enmity between Christ and the seed of the serpent. Mary was, over to, Mary was ever to be in the exalted state of soul which the serpent had destroyed in man in sanctifying grace. Do you realize what they're trying to say? Mary wasn't a sinner. Because she was handpicked, so there was no sin in her. She, she wasn't a sinner. She didn't have a fallen nature. She didn't have the fallen nature because right at the moment that she was conceived, she was touched by God and kept from a sinful nature. If the Bible said it, yeah, I believe it too. But the problem is, is it's not in there. And then the Catholic scholars admit, well, that came in after the 4th century. What happened at the 4th century? The rise of Constantine, the rise of paganism into mixed into Christianity, the names from Peter to Jupiter, all the names changed. Kept the same statues because, hey, nobody wants to get rid of a good statue. I mean, so, I mean, that's a, those are old, man. There's a lot of devils in those statues. You just can't get rid of statues like that. When you've got that many devils inside of them, you've got to keep them in there. So, I mean, Jupiter's toe became Peter's toe? Yes, I don't know. I, Mary became, Isis became Mary. Semiramis became Mary. Well, just change her name. It's okay. The little child that was Nimrod, or that was, that was Nimrod's son. That little child became Jesus. That Mary with the glowing, weird, scary, spooky stuff on her head. The, 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 yeah, the aura, or whatever she calls it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All that stuff, and just glowing in there. Well, we'll just change the names. It works for me. Constantine says, it's great. He says, guess what? I'll give you priest buildings, I'll build you sanctuaries, I'll build you monuments, I'll incorporate you. I had to fit that in there. I had to fit that. I, I'm sorry, I had to fit that in there. Brother Anthony, it was too easy to fit that in there. I, I had it just it just segue was just perfect. Constantine and his incorporation plan. Worked. Worked great, didn't it? So I'll build you these big buildings, tax-free. All right, somebody's getting mad. We're here banging going on here. What's going on here? Somebody's upset. All right. He says here, God put, uh, he says here that uh, only the continual union of Mary with grace explains sufficiently the enmity between her and Satan. The proto-evangelium. Therefore, in the original text, contains a direct promise of the Redeemer, and in the conjunction therewith, the manifestation of the masterpiece of his redemption, the perfect preservation of his virginal mother from original sin. Now, how they went from A to Z there is really confusing, because they went, okay, here and here. See, you don't have to explain away God's miracles, folks. Mary didn't have to be without sin. Mary didn't have to be perfect. She was a vessel. He would come through the line of a woman. He would come through there. He would come from his father. He would sit on the throne of his father, David. God promised that. Mary didn't have to be perfect, okay? Mary didn't have to be this, this um, uh, without sin. She didn't have to be, uh, have a separate salvation than everybody else. No, he didn't. 
The salutation, and then he goes on to say, the salutation of the angel Gabriel, hail, full of grace. That's not quite how it's said, is it? I don't, I mean, sort of, but not quite. You know, they like to change the Bible. Well, you know, when they admit they don't use it much, but they really don't use the Bible much. Uh, the Roman Catholic papacy, papacy they, they don't really use the Bible. They don't like it, really. kind of gets in their way a little bit. There's a lot of churches today that don't like the Bible either because it kind of gets in their way a little bit of what they want to do, so they just kind of leave that alone. And the angels came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed art thou among women. I mean, he didn't say that she was blessed above all women. Right? Okay. Indicates a unique abundance of grace, a supernatural godlike state of soul, which finds its explanation only in the Immaculate Conception of Mary. So they make her a god. Are you listening? They they make her a god. She was godlike. Well, isn't that the same thing? Aren't they doing the same thing that Satan did? Yea, hath God said? He said, Ye shall be as gods. That's what the woman always wanted, wasn't it? That's what she had wanted there. He tempted her with godhood, right? He tempted her to come out of her order, come out of her place, and take on godhood. Same thing he's trying to sell here. Same thing Rome is you, you Godhood. From the text Proverbs 8 and Ecclesiastes 24, wisdom of God and which in liturgy are applied to Mary, the most beautiful work of God's wisdom. He goes on to say, I won't read all this. Thou art fair, O my love, and there is no spot in thee. No theological conclusion can be drawn. So he's admitting that all these verses that they want to use, he says, but there isn't really any evidence of it. Like, I don't think I'd teach something if there was absolutely no evidence of it, would you? I mean, I think I'd probably be like, I'm not going to teach somebody something that I have no biblical authority. But this goes, here's the, with Roman Catholicism, that's not how it works. The, the Pope speaks ex cathedra. What he says is canon law. What he says is the voice of God, right? By the way, there was one other man that said he had the voice of God, that he bragged about it, and everybody bragged about him, and he ended up dying and worms ate his body. Remember that? Herod? He speaks like God. Well, there went that guy. Basically, what they're admitting to you, it's Catholic dogma. How about even Origen the heretic? Remember Origen? You know who that guy is, don't you, Brother Paul? You know who Origen is, don't you? Origen, 185 AD, he said this, Although he ascribed to Mary high spiritual prerogatives, thought that at the time of Christ's passion, the sword of disbelief pierced Mary's soul, that she was struck by the poniard of doubt, and that for her sins also Christ died. So Origen even, he was a heretic, and Origen actually said, well, I mean, Mary wasn't perfect. She was a sinner. Mary had sin. She needed Jesus to forgive her, and even Origen understood that. In the same manner, St. Basil, St. Basil, is that what they named Basil after, or was he named after Basil? I don't know. Someday they'll write about St. Paul over here. Right, Brother Paul? St. Paul the bearded one. That's right, amen. In the same manner, St. Basil writes in the 4th century, he sees in the sword of which Simeon speaks the doubt which pierced Mary's soul. I agree with that, by the way. I think that there was doubt there. It pierced her soul. She's human. St. Chrysostom. Did I say his name right? I don't know these church father guys. I don't know them. I accuses her of ambition and of putting herself forward unduly when she sought to see, speak to Jesus at Capernaum when she was at the wedding of Feast of Cana. I'm going to show you that in a second here. By the way, there's not one Bible verse that says that Mary was conceived without sin and had no sin nature. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It says, For the wages of sin is death. But they found a way to get around that one too, and I'm going to show you that. He is the sinless, perfect Son of the living God, Jesus Christ. He is the Redeemer, and He's the one that everyone needs. Mary had a sinful father and a, and a sinful mother and needed her sins forgiven. She was a sinner, too, that needed Christ to redeem her. The fathers call Mary the tabernacle exempt from defilement and corruption. 
Origen went back kind of and forth, and he said he calls her the worthy of God, immaculate of the immaculate, most complete sanctity, perfect justice, never deceived, neither deceived by the persuasion of the serpent, nor infected with his poisonous breathings. Ambrose says she is incorrupt, a virgin immune through grace from every stain of sin. Maximus of Turin calls her a dwelling fit for Christ, not because of her habit of body, but because of original grace. Theodotus says terms her a virgin innocent, without spot, void of culpability, holy in body and in soul, a lily springing for among thorns, untaught the ills of Eve, nor was there any communion in her of light with darkness. And when not yet born, she was consecrated to God. Yeah, they should have an honest job because they didn't get any of this from the words of God. They never quoted scripture once. In refuting Pelagius, St. Augustine declares that all the just have truly known of sin except the Holy Virgin Mary, of whom for the honor of the Lord I will have no question whatever where sin is concerned. Oh, I won't even entertain the thought that she could have sinned. One says, Mary was pledged to Christ. It is evident to the notorious that she was pure from eternity, exempt from every defect. She was formed without stain, said St. Proclus. She was created in condition more sublime and glorious than all the natures. Does it amaze you that all these people had, had the, the words of God? Or many of them did, not all of them, but many of them did. How could you believe something like this? It's not even anything anywhere in the Bible at all. There's no biblical basis at all. None. So he says here, and I'm almost done here with this actually, he says here, proof from reason. There is an incongruity in the supposition that the flesh, from which the flesh of the Son of God was to be formed, should ever have belonged to one who was the slave of that arch enemy, whose power he came on earth to destroy. Hence the axiom of pseudo Anselmus, developed by Dun Scotus de Sut, it was becoming that the mother of the Redeemer should have been free from the power of sin and from the moment of her, ex of her existence. God could give her his, this privilege, therefore he gave it to her. Again, it is remarked that a peculiar privilege was granted the prophet and to the prophet Jeremiah and to St. John the Baptist. They were sanctified in their mother's womb because by their preaching they had a special share in the work of preparing. By the way, I'm going to blow out. That's not what John the Baptist said, though, is it? Sure, it says that he was that, that he had the Holy Ghost for his mother's womb. It says that, right? But listen to what John said, though, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 3, verse number 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And he suffered him. Uh, John, John said, I, I need you to baptize me. Amen? That's what he said. Why? Because he knew he was a man that needed Christ. He didn't have any redemption on his own. Now, from the Immaculate Concept... Wait a minute now. If Mary wasn't a sinner, then we have a problem here, don't we? Do you know what the problem arose in, with, with Mary not being a sinner? Well, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. Well, if Mary's not a sinner, well, then she couldn't have died. Well, there you go. So they made up another whopper. You know what they called that? The Great Assumption. <laughs> Did I say that wrong, brother? Did I say that wrong? <laughs> it's a good one. So, I mean, Mary was just strolling around one day and she was on a mountain and all of a sudden she just ascended straight to heaven. She didn't die and some angels took her to heaven. Because after all, I mean, if the wages of sin is death and Mary wasn't a sinner, then obviously she's got to go. She didn't die. She just ascended. Only problem with that is that Scripture doesn't say that. The second problem with that is, is that there's only one that had that power to ascend that way. Now, I know that in the Old Testament we see Enoch was not for God took him, but God took him. Jesus Christ of his own power ascended to heaven. Of his own power. No one did it for him. All power was given unto him. Amen? So they say that, but they say, well, Mary wasn't a sinner, so she didn't really die, she ascended. Well, I mean, one whopper has to lead to another whopper, right? I mean, you got, if she didn't have any sin, then she couldn't die. So whoosh, there she goes. 
Mary, the sinless mother of God, the perpetual virgin, bodily assumed into heaven as queen over all. It says here, here's what they make up about that. Joined to Christ, the head, and in communion with all his saints, the faithful must in the first place reverence the memory of the glorious ever Virgin Mary, mother of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mother of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. No, she's not the mother of God. Not the mother of the Father. Do you understand what they're saying? Get what they're saying here. She was the mother of Christ. Not the mother of God the Father. Mother of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of the gift of sublime grace, she far surpasses all creatures, both in heaven and on earth. The Immaculate Virgin, pres preserved free from all stain of original sin, was taken up body and soul into the heavenly glory where her earthly life was over. And exalted... Uh-oh. Here we go. And exalted by the Lord as queen over all things. Um that she might be the more fully conformed to her Son, the Lord of Lords, and conqueror of sin and death. Dogmatic Constitution on the Church, Chapter 8, 1, 52, 53, something else, page 378, 381 to 382. I just want to give you that documentation just so you didn't think I was making it up. However, where does that queen over all things come from? Well, the Bible talked about that queen of heaven, Jeremiah seven seventeen. Seest thou not that... What they do in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, the children gather wood and the fire kindle, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, saith the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. They said, no, they said, we're not going to listen to you. But we will continue to do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, as we have done, we and our fathers and our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have consumed, been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? So is that queen of heaven the mother of Jesus Christ or is that queen of heaven Isis? That's who it is. What does the Bible say about Mary? Let's look at the scriptures. Turn to Luke chapter 1, verse number 28. We'll be done here. 26, excuse me. We're going to go through these scriptures real quick. All the quick verses on what the Bible says about Mary, and then we're going to be done here, okay? I want you to understand the Immaculate Conception is a great deception. It's a different Jesus. It's a different gospel. It's a different Mary. It's not the Mary that's in the Bible. It's not the one. Don't be fooled by that. And you correct people when they try to tell you they're Roman Catholic, and they try to do it. You say, well, stop. What do you believe about Mary? What do you believe about Jesus? Luke chapter 1, verse number 26, In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a city, unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man, whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou. Oh, excuse me, verse number 42, moving ahead, Luke chapter 1, verse 42. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit also, also hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaid. For, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud, the imagination of their heart. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich hath he sent away empty. 
All right, so she goes on to explain. Uh, she's giving glory to God, by the way. Now I want you to turn to Luke chapter 2, verse number 44. I believe Mary sinned right here. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem to seek him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Notice the spelling, father. Right? Notice his father. Or when she said, Thy father has sought thee. Jesus is like, No, God knows where I'm at right now. He knows exactly my father knows exactly where I'm. I'm right in the center of his temple, right here. He knows exactly where I am. However, how is it that Mary and Joseph leave the Lord <laughs> as a child, leave him there and don't know where he's at? Right. She was a sinner just like everybody else. I mean, I, let me ask you. I mean, would you, any of you take off and then like a day later be like, man, you know, where's Jesus? I mean... I mean, uh, where do you go? You know, I'm, I think we're missing somebody. Or like you take off from Texas and you, and you get here and, and you left John. It's like, you know, where's John? Where where did he go? How do we head back to the town? I mean, understand that? I mean, that's not exactly the best mothering skills right there, right? I'm not being mean. I might make a Catholic mad, but it's the truth. She left her son. She left him there and didn't know where he was at. It's not exactly great mothering skills. Oh, <gasps> you spoke against the Blessed Mother. It's okay. She was a sinner too. So, anyway. So it says here, and they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. Then Mary didn't understand it. Wait a minute. I thought she was kept from she. I thought she was like God walking. What happened? She didn't understand what he was saying. Why couldn't she understand what Jesus Christ was saying? If she was the if she was the anointed. If you don't have a sin nature, you you have perfect understanding. Am I right? If you are free from sin, then your understanding should be pretty clear, right? You should get it. If you don't have any sin nature at all, if you're never tainted by sin, she didn't understand what he was saying. Why? says here, and they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. What do you mean you're about your father's business? And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And the third day, turn to John chapter 2. Here's where his mother becomes very presumptuous. She almost tries to kind of tell him what to do. Well, she does try to tell him what to do, kind of. Then he kind of sets her, he probably kind of puts her in her place here. Okay. John chapter 2, verse number 1. In the third day there was a marriage in Cain of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called, and, and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. <laughs> Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Why was he saying that to her? Well, woman was not actually a disrespectful term back then. It wasn't disrespectful. But what he was saying, he was putting her in place. He's like, what do you, I mean, it's not my time to come forth. What do you want me to do? This isn't my wedding. This isn't my, I mean, what are you, what are you asking me to do? Are you asking me to, like, make my appearance here and, and, and do something? Are you asking me to perform a miracle? Is that what you're doing? So he kind of puts her in her place. He kind of tells her, you don't know, no, you know, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour has not yet come. What hour was he? Well, do a study. What was he talking about? His hour, the hour of his of his uh, appearance when he was going to come. You know, the hour of his death. The other things he talks about the different hours in his life of of different things, and that's one of them is his appearance. He's like, it's it's not really. So what did he do here? See, she wanted him. Why don't you just come out and be Jesus Christ and do a uh, uh, you know do some amazing things here? You're the Messiah. Show them all. What have I to do with thee, woman? My hour is not yet come. 
So what does he do? He privately does something. Look at what he does here. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. He didn't, what didn't he do? He didn't come to the major governors of the feast and those that were, were the prominent people in the feast and do a miracle in front of them. What did he do? He took the servants off to the side. He did a miracle in private and provided the water. But he didn't do it in front of everybody. Why? Because his hour has not yet come. It wasn't time for him to do that. And he wasn't going to do, he wasn't going to allow her to push him into it either. Do you see that? Understand that. If you read your Bible long enough just to skip, just not, not just to skip over a few verses, you'll, you'll pick up some of these things that are very, con they're right there. It's not reading anything into it either. It's very clear that's what he was doing. That's what, why do you think, okay, if that wasn't it, then why did he even make the wine then? He could have just been like, my hour's not yet come, woman. I'm not going to help you. Get out of here. Get away from me. I'm not doing anything. It's not my time. Let me go make some biscuits or something. He could, he just, that's, that's, that's what he could have said or something. But he didn't. He didn't, right? He did it. He, he made, the, he made the, the wine. But he did it with the servants, not with the governor. He didn't draw it out, you know. Anyway, so make sense? All right. Jesus is rebuking his mother for trying to lead. Jesus saith under woman, so our Lord speaks also. This is a commentary here. It is probable this was a constant appellation he used to her. But anyway, you get the point. I'm not going to read you that. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 47. Here's another, another uh, interesting thing here about Mary. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hands toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Wait a minute. What was wrong with Jesus? I mean, why didn't he just... I mean, his mother came. Surely he should have stopped everything that he was doing for the immaculate, immaculate conce conceived Mary, the one that was the, the, the queen of heaven. And surely he should have stopped everything and listened to her, right? He said, no. What was he showing there? Well... God knew this heresy would arise today, okay? And God is showing you that order right there, that God is not a respecter of persons. Mary was an honored vessel of God. We will not deny that. And she was a lady of purity. We will not deny that, okay? And she was used of God. However, this sets the context, sets it in proper order. He's not, he's not stopping everything for the queen of heaven because she's not the queen of heaven. There is no queen of heaven, okay? There isn't one. But he says, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. What is he saying? That's all level at the cross, ain't it? Everybody's got to get redeemed the same way. Everybody's got, got to get forgiven the same way. Everybody, everybody has sinned the same way. So those are the little bit. And then there's another instance with Mary when, when he says, Behold thy mother, and he has one of his disciples take care of his mother. Now that wasn't Mary, that wasn't Jesus making Mary the mother of all Christians. Okay? That was a man that was on that was dying that said, Take care of my mother. I mean, that's a pretty normal thing to do, right? If your mother, if your if your husband was if your father was dead, okay, I mean your earthly dad was dead and he and your mother didn't have anybody to take care of and you were the only male figure alive, what did he do? He said, Be the head over my mother and take care of her. I mean, that's not, he didn't look at everybody all and say, she's your mother, she's all your mother. The Bible never says that. It references her being in the upper room again or, or among the disciples and Mary, the mother of Jesus, was with them, but it never says anything else about it. never calls her the mother of God, never says anything like that, never references anything like that, never references an immaculate conception, never, never references anything. What is all that? It's all designed to get your focus off of Christ and put it on man, put it on woman. It's a cult. It's the largest mystery religion out there, Roman Catholicism. It is the head and mother of all of them. And this immaculate conception is a part of Islam too. And I'm going to show you that next hour. Father, thank you, Lord, for your words. Thank you for the truth of them. Thank you, Lord, that we have the King James Bible that will show us the truth in everything. Help us to follow it. Thank you for it. Bless us now, Lord. Bless this meal that we're about to receive in the time we have together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.